Uh, all right. Well, um, we are in a series here called The Jesus Way, and we are in pursuit of what does it look like to truly live the Jesus way. We've been trying to dismantle the American way, the church way, the whatever way you might have learned, and really wholeheartedly in pursuit of what is the undiluted gospel? What does it look like to follow the Jesus way? Jesus had a distinct culture. He has a way, and it is narrow, and how do we get on that way? How do we be with Jesus? How do we you know, become like Jesus so that we can do what Jesus did? And so this is the journey we're on. Um, we've taken the last, or the first part of this series. We're going to be here, I already warned you, we're going to be here till the fall. We are going to be here for a while, so get comfortable being uncomfortable in this series, all right? Um, but we're starting by talking about different cultural aspects we see in Jesus. Heaven has a culture. The kingdom of God has a culture. And we need to be more attuned to that culture than any other culture we belong to. We need to be more kingdom than American, more kingdom than whatever, you know, other culture, subcultures you've picked up, right? Culture isn't bad, but we need to have our loyalty to the kingdom. And it's kingdom culture that's going to change the world, not anything else, right? And so we're learning. We are in this journey of studying each week different kingdom cultural aspects that Jesus demonstrated so that we can apply them to our own life. And so... Um, We've talked about culture of restoration, right? We've talked about culture of service, culture of inclusivity. We've been looking at some of these different things. And um, this week we're talking about, listen, I struggled to name this, so just go on the journey with me. I went back and forth because I'm like, how do I put this into words? I was going to call it culture of truth, but it didn't feel right. So we're calling culture of truthful love, culture of truthful love, all right? So I want to start in um, John 18. There's this moment. Where Jesus is standing before Pilate, you might, you might have read this before, and it says, then Pilate responded, oh, so then you're a king? You are right, Jesus said. I was born a king, and I have come into this world to prove what truth really is. And everyone, listen to these words, everyone who loves the truth will receive my words. Pilate looked at Jesus and said, what is truth? Silence filled the room. He went back out to where the Jewish leaders were, and he says, he's not guilty. I couldn't find one fault with him. Isn't this the question that everybody's asking? What is truth? I feel like more than now, what is even true anymore? I feel like so many people are in a, a season of deconstructing, wrestling through their beliefs. You know, we're, we're living in a, a culture in a time where... where um, Everybody's redefining even what truth is. What is truth? We know in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus is truth. Jesus is ultimate truth, right? Um, that word that's used there for truth in the Greek, aletheia, it means reality. I am reality, says Jesus. I am sincerity. I am divine truth. I am what's real. I am what's authentic. I am true. I am real. Jesus is truth. He is the source of truth. He is the word, right? He is the truth itself made flesh. But also, God is love, right? 1 John 4, 16, we know God is love. So you have Jesus, the word, the truth made flesh, the truth itself, and he also completely defines the word love. Jesus is totally driven by love. He's consumed by love. Everything he does is because of love. So Jesus, when we look at Jesus, we see the fullness of truth and we see the fullness of love in his life. It's who he is. And we watch how he walks this out truthful love in every interaction. And honestly, it's so breathtaking to me and mind-blowing, because I think that there's something in our culture that we've really, really lost, especially the connection between these two things. First, I want to talk about the, the distortion of truth that we're seeing in culture, okay? Um, it's very common right now to see, you know, truth having been redefined as something that's subjective, your truth. 
what you think, right? Um, it's very relative to us. We, we feverishly take scissors to scripture and just cut what we want, disregard what we don't. I've told you this before, and I know it's, it's not always easy to hear, but it's the truth. You will always find somebody and probably even a church who will endorse your sin. We have become, as a culture, very, very good at just, hey, I, I'll, I want to accept this about God, but not that. I like those scriptures, but not those. I, you know, we, I take this as literal. I take that as just maybe kind of advice if I feel like it. And we approach many times truth that way because there's a, a cultural distortion of truth. Um. Many times, those who claim that they're fighting for God's truth, if we're honest, are more accurately fighting for their opinion, their religious preference, their political ideology, the Constitution, sweet Jesus, or half-baked theology, right? And we say we're fighting for God's truth, and many times there's such a, a distortion and a mixture that many times in the West, in the church, we don't even know what biblical truth is versus cultural versus whatever. It's just gotten real mi mixed up. Um, sometimes this, you know, and how this distortion of truth looks, it's we'll see believers wearing their offense um, at sinners and at the world almost like a badge of honor. And we also live in a world that, that celebrates tolerance, but has taken that to mean that it's wrong and selfish to believe in ultimate truth. That if you believe Jesus is the only way to God, you're arrogant and entitled and stupid. There's also a massive misinformation war happening in our day, right? Leaving people crippled to even know what is true, what is, you know, not even knowing how to critically think. Um, so much mixture that, that even when presented with truth, we see people, like masses of people, like not even able to, to receive truth when they hear it or facts. And yet in the middle of all of this, in the middle of all of the, the, the cultural distortion of truth, Jesus is standing there saying, I am truth. I am truth. I am the truth. I am ultimate truth. I am true. I am genuine. I am, I am sincere. I am reality. And the devil hates the truth. Why? We know the truth sets us free. We know where there's lack of truth, people are in bondage to fear, to, you know, selfishness, to all kinds of things, sin. We're in bondage when we're not in truth. And it's no wonder that the enemy of our souls is, is wildly going after trying to distort truth to put people in bondage. Truth sets us free. The more truth is present, the freer and the healthier we become. So not only is there a distortion of truth, but there's a distortion of love in our day. We know, biblically, that love is fierce. Love is powerful. It's selfless. It's hard and gritty and does the deep, hard work. It keeps showing up when you want to give up or when you're offended or when you disagree with somebody. Love doesn't get up because it's offended. doesn't leave, doesn't pull away. It's action. It's, it, we know love is extremely costly to self, right? It co it's going to cost you your comfort, your pride, your time, your preferences. Love is costly. The problem is we seem to have defined love to be something really different in our culture. We don't want to have the hard conversations because that feels like maybe that's going to be unloving. We don't want to challenge people. Or question their choices because culture has told us, accept me as I am or you don't love me. So we just say things like, I'll support you no matter what. Follow your heart. And we let people follow their heart right to hell. 
right to pain, right to destruction, because we, we don't know how to, we're afraid, we've been told if we speak truth or, or you have a different opinion, you know, that you have to keep it to yourself. Or We're so tied, we don't even understand what it means to love somebody. It, it feels very complicated. You know, the reality is it's, it's actually deeply unloving not to bring truth into your relationships. Because without truth, you're just protecting yourself, and that's deeply selfish. And when we really care about people, when we really love people, we'll say, I'm worried about you in this area. And you, it's not a shame. It's not a condemnation. It's a, I love you enough to, see, not, to, to not want to see you suffer. I want, I want to walk with you. You're better than that. Come on. right? It's reminding people who they are. We reduce loving somebody to, to merely just trying to keep them comfortable, not wanting to hurt their feelings. You know, also with the rate of divorce and, and parental ab uh, you know, abandonment in this, in this nation, our understanding of what love is is deeply shattered. Love has become an emotion, a, a feeling, until it's not, right? Like, even the saying, like... I, I've fallen out of love with you. What does that even mean? We, we, Hold on, I had this whole conversation the other day, but what does that saying mean? Like, what does that even mean? I get the cultural, like, what it means, but as believers, like, how do you fall in or fall out? You get your butt up and you make a choice every day, right? Like, I, I, I get the feelings part, but, like, you know, like, love is a choice. I mean, I fell out of love of paying my mortgage a long time ago, but I still do it. <laughs> Right? Yeah. It's like, it's so strange that, that love has become, gotten this distorted perception of it's just based on your emotions. Oh, well, I just don't love you anymore. How convenient. I get to leave, like, or whatever, right? Like, love, biblical love, true love is different. It's gritty. And yet, you know, God is actual love. And we see what actual love is like when we look at him, right? It's deeply sacrificial. It's patient. It's willing to wade into our mess with us, but not leave us there. It calls us higher. It's unconditional. Not afraid to challenge us. He lays his entire life down for us. Always present. So the truth is, you know, that we've struggled to understand both truth and love. And honestly, we seem to, as a culture, have ripped them apart from each other. In fact, we have people in two different camps, the truth camp or the love camp. Many times. People that are like, people need truth. And over here, people need love. And it's, because, it's like, wait, what? How do you ever separate? How do you take off the right and left arm of God and try to go to war with those things? Like, you can't. You cannot separate truth and love. In fact, it's actually impossible Hear me, it is impossible to have one without the other. Truth is not truth without love. Love is not love without truth. I think this is one of the biggest challenges in our culture. Truth is not truth without love, and love is not love without truth. 1 John 3.18, dear children, let us, love with, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Love must include truth. 1 Corinthians 13.6, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love and truth are on the same team. They're on the same side. Real love and real truth can't be separated. And God is both, right? And you, you can't really love people without the truth. And you can't really be true without love. There's this profound connection between these two. And um, we really can't have one without the other. St. Saint, Saint John Paul the Great said, Do not accept anything as the truth if it lacks love. And do not accept anything as love which lacks truth. One without the other becomes a destructive lie. Without truth, we won't know how to love others. Truthful love. That's why, that's why I merge them. <laughs> Truthful love. Because <laughs> so often we, we, you know, we get into these arguments about, well, we need to be loving. Yes. You know, but we, people need the truth. Yes. But 
For us, if we're going to follow Jesus, you better marry those things quickly in your heart. Because they're married in his heart. And we're not going to have effect, we're not going to be effective in loving people if we don't have a right, you know, love of truth and commitment to truth. And we're not going to be effective at, at bringing truth anywhere if we're not coming from a place of love. You might as well just be quiet, right? And so this is the invitation. Um, couple things I, I want to, we're going to, we're going to in a minute, we're going to look at how Jesus kind of walked this out, but I want to just point out a couple things really quick about the connection between truth and love, okay? Number one, truth aims at love. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Okay, instruction, instructing somebody is not the goal. It is the means to the end. It is the means to the goal. The goal is love. The goal in relationship is love, right? So just getting on Facebook and telling people what they need to do is not helpful. I hope we're all done with Facebook. I mean, (laughs) Jesus, take the will. It's not helpful, right? The goal has to be love, right? Um, Truth serves love. Truth is a tool in love. Education serves relationships, right? The goal of our education, the goal of instruction, the goal of truth is love. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another how to stir up to love and good deeds, encouraging one another. The aim of our considering one another and encouraging one another is that we stir up love, not I'm going to make sure you get in line. Not I'm going to make sure you know God is mad at you. Not I'm going to make sure you know you're wrong. No, the goal is love. How do we stir up each other in love? How do we remind each other that love is, is our true north? How do we see each other through eyes of love, right? So truth is constantly aiming at love. But love is constantly aiming at truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. We already read that. Love is glad when truth is spoken, right? It aims at truth. It supports truth. There's this verse in 2 Corinthians 2, 4. It says, out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you, with many tears, not so you would be made sorrowful, sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. Paul is filled with love, and it compels him to, to write a letter that was hard to the church in Corinthians. Right? He writes this letter and, and begins to, to talk to them and, and say some things, bring some truth and some, some correction, but he's doing it from a place of love. Truthful love, right? It's this place of of the emergence of truth and love. Something else to think about how these things relate together is love shapes how we speak the truth. You've probably heard this verse, Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. As we grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Now, I always kind of had the idea that that meant like, If you just kind of like do the southern thing, just say it kind of sweet. (laughs) One of my, sometimes my kids have said this, and it's like, and you always know it's coming when they're like, I don't mean to be mean, but you're like, oh, great. Just stop, because whatever you're going to say, I already know. Like, (laughs) I don't mean to be mean, but you know, it's coming, right? Um. Just saying it nicely is not what this verse is saying. You're a jerk. No, that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is actually saying you need to get your heart to a place of love for somebody before you try speaking in their life. This isn't just, hey, say it in a nice tone. I mean, that, that helps. It does. But the challenge is actually love some folks. Actually, let God break your heart for people. The problem is, 
So often we want to speak truth into, into populations and groups of people that we actually have no investment in love for. And we're doing more damage than anything. And, and Jesus, now here's the thing. Jesus said some harsh things. Right? So it, speaking the truth in love doesn't mean it's just always going to be like, you're so wonderful. I mean, he says some crazy things to the religious bullies of his day. He's intense, and he's not unloving in it. Because sometimes, hear me, sometimes making bold statements of truth are necessary to show love to one group, especially a group that's being oppressed. Sometimes that's necessary. Jesus models it. But Jesus also went to the cross for those same religious bullies because he loved them. So he's not just talking out of his own offense and anger and whatever, because so often we think we can do that. Well, Jesus took up the, you know, the evil power structures, or here I go, I'm going to just go on a rampage. Are you willing to lay your life down for those folks too? And that's what gave him the authority to do it. He came from a place of love. 2 Timothy uh, 2, 24 says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everybody, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So love shapes how we speak, how we bring truth. And the opposite of that is true as well. Truth shapes how we show love. 1 John 5 says, this is how we can be sure that we love the children of God, by having a passionate love for God and by obedience to his commands. True love for God means obeying his commands, obeying his truth, right? So it's not always obvious, like, what's the loving thing to do? And so John tells us that truth will help you know how to love somebody. What does God say about them? What is, what's God's instruction for how to interact with people? Follow that. That's what's loving. Because sometimes it's confusing to know how to love people. How do I love somebody who's just insulted me? Huh. And you go to the Bible and you're like, turn the other cheek. Dang, I was hoping for something different. (laughs) The Bible's got a lot to say. The problem is, once again, we're like, where's my scissors? I don't like the verse, right? Cut it out. Let's, let's get a different verse. Let's get some verse on holy re- revenge God. Like, let's go to the, let's dig deep in the, in the Old Testament. <laughs> the Bible's got lots of, of wisdom and truth for us about how we navigate, how we love. And so, especially, hear me, in a culture in a day which has redefined for us what truth and love is, you need to know what the Word of God is. Because once again, culture tells you to love somebody is to just agree with whatever they're doing. Don't ever question anything. Accept all things. And the scripture says that's actually not what love is. Yes, you love all people, of course. But remember we talked about inclusive and Jesus, the culture of inclusivity. Everybody was invited to Jesus' table. But the focus was Jesus, not just what the heck they were doing, right? Everybody was invited to Jesus' table, but the focus of the table was Jesus. So we see this, this bouncing back and forth. These are the two sides of this coin. Love and truth cannot be separated. Love and truth cannot be separated, okay? So how do we do this? How do we walk this out? How do we live truthful love? Jesus models this so beautifully in his life. He has this constant culture of truthful love. Um, so we're going to quickly look at four things that, that, um, that stand out to me when I look at Jesus' life. The first one is that Jesus loved the truth. Jesus loved the truth. I heard somebody once say, your attitude towards the truth determines the outcome of your life. Your attitude towards the truth determines the outcome of your life. Jesus loved the truth. If we don't love the truth, if we resist it, we resist freedom, we resist salvation, we resist Christ. But if you love the truth, there's so much life and healing and freedom that comes into your life, right? 
How do we know that Jesus loved the truth? Well, there's lots of, lots of examples, but do you remember when he was young and he's on a family vacation? And he goes into the temple because he's so hungry to hear the word and he gets so lost in the reading of the scroll and he's so hungry for truth that his entire entourage and family have left and he's still there. We see this over and over in his life. We see him memorizing scripture, studying scripture, quoting scripture, you know, speaking of scripture. He poured himself out. He, he loved and was hungry for truth in his life. And I think what was some, what's the most beautiful thing is he applied it. Right? He didn't just, it wasn't head knowledge. We see him digesting and applying truth in his life all the time. When you love somebody or something, you prioritize it. You're unashamed of it. You pursue it. And you're loyal to it. Jesus repeatedly modeled in his life that he loved the truth. Right? He prioritized it in his schedule, in his conversations, in his habits. He was the word, and yet he was constantly in the word. That's powerful. He prioritized truth over convenience over and over. There are so many times he's like, if I say the truth, you're about to throw me off this cliff, and here he goes. Here's the truth. And they're like trying to stone him or throw him off a cliff. I mean, he over and over prioritizes truth over convenience. Why? Because he understood people would not be free without the truth. He loved us enough to speak the truth, even when it was hard and uncomfortable, and he knew he was going to be misunderstood. He understood how powerful and freeing and inviting truth was. He loved it. He never holds back from declaring truth, even when it's so costly to him, when it caused people to reject him. We always see him in pursuit of his father's will. How many times we see him praying, you know, not my will, but yours be done, right? He's always, I only do what I see my father doing. He's constantly in pursuit of truth. He's not just like, guys, I'm the son of the world. I'm the son of God. I can pretty much do whatever I want. He's not doing that. He is a submitted man, submitted in love and truth to his father. He's constantly pursuing truth. And he's loyal to the truth. He never compromises, not once. He doesn't compromise. He doesn't give up on truth when it gets hard, right? Truth required him to go to the cross. He doesn't shy away when truth gets costly, when it becomes personal. His love for the truth provoked him, provoked in him a lifestyle of this radical, truthful love for God and for us. He was so full of integrity because he loved the truth. Your attitude towards the truth determines the outcome of your life. Do I love the truth? Do I, I mean, I'm asking myself this. You should ask yourself this. Do we love the truth, truly? Are we casual with the truth? Are we kind of like, you know, goalposts, they can be moved a little bit here or there. Do we fear God? Are we hungry for the word? Do we, you know, are we kind of like, I pretty much know it's in the Bible. I'm set. Like, are, do you, are you in pursuit of truth daily? Do we love truth? Right? Am I pursuing it? Am I studying it? Am I allowing it to transform me? Do I speak up on its behalf? Okay, so there's this really odd and terrifying verse in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 9, and it it talks, it's kind of talking about the end times and the Antichrist and, and kind of just giving this picture of, of what's to come. And it says, this man will come, speaking of the Antichrist, this man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will be believe these lies, then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. What? It's a weird verse. What's happening here is there's this picture being laid out of the antichrist, anti the nature of God, right? The plan of the enemy is to bring deception. We're seeing this so much deception in our culture right now. You guys, it's only, there will only be more deception. We need to understand this. 
we need to wake up to this reality. The enemy, just as God, Jesus says, I am truth, the enemy is, I am lies, right? That's his claim to fame. The enemy is the ultimate deceiver. Deception is everywhere, and it will only be more prevalent. That should not make you afraid. That should make you love some truth. That should make you get, get into some truth, right? That should make you want to fall in love with the truth. Because what you see here, what happens is those who don't love the truth are swayed, are deceived. And it's not, I had to really study this because this really bothered me. I was like, God, it's not like you just go in, wait, what? You go in, make people crazy? Like, what are you talking about? When you, when you really break this down, what this is saying is it's like God is handing people over to their own desires. He releases them. It's like he releases people. And you, you don't love the truth, fine. You can have what you want. And they get released over to their own deception. That is, that is scary. I don't want that. Because I've had a taste, and it's enough in our day and age, of what people drunk on deception look like. No, thank you. Am I the only one? Okay. This, this is interesting. What, my rela- you know, what is my relationship to truth? Do I love truth? Do I love truth? Jesus loved the truth. The second thing we see in Jesus' culture is Jesus demonstrated truth. And I love this about him. I love that he never asks us to do something he's not already done. Right? There's absolutely no hypocrisy in him. Zero. He lived in the truth. He demonstrates truth. Right? He first learned how not to be consumed by fear and anxiety in his own walk before he tells us, you know, be anxious about nothing. He first learns how to overcome temptation in the wilderness before he looks at us and says, go and sin no more, because it's possible. We see him over and over choose the narrow path, the unpopular path, the hard path, before also calling us to the narrow path. We see Jesus down on his knees, washing feet, healing people, people embracing the, the lepers, right, before calling us to do that. He always leads. We see him wrestle with his own humanity in the Garden of Gethsemane, longing to avoid the pain, weary from the journey, longing to, that there could be another way. But we see him choose obedience before he looks to us and says, Join me in obedience, right? If he's telling us to be generous, it's because he's he's generous and he's doing it. If he's telling us to pray, it's because he is prayerful. If he's telling us to pick up our cross, it's because he's carrying hits. He He has so much integrity. Jesus demonstrates truth. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I don't know about you, but... I can easily fall into just discouragement or shame with my own lack of integrity, right? Where it's like, man, I know prayer changes things. How prayerful am I actually even being? Or I want to serve people, but I also kind of just want to do what's best for me. Said every mother with kids, right? Like, (laughs) I want to... You know, I have a desire to, to be this way, to whatever it is, and I see my own lack, and I can, I can get frustrated. I long for more demonstrating. You know, I think in the West, we have, um, we have a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, a lot of tools, a lot of truth, if you will. But I think the Western church is is often so lacking in power because we have a demonstration issue. We have a demonstration issue. You see, we talked about this before a couple weeks ago. You have to, before you can do what Jesus did, you have to be with Jesus so that you can become like Jesus. We're trying to do what Jesus did without those two steps, and we're powerless. We don't look like him, we don't feel like him, we don't sound like him, we're not moving in authority. It's a demonstration issue. You know, I remember years ago when we were um, doing children's ministry and God was moving powerfully through our kids and we were watching kids, I mean, God powerfully used children, children having radical encounters with God, children literally, you know, praying in hospitals and seeing 
malaria, AIDS, typhoid patients completely healed, children planting churches. It was crazy. This was a crazy move of God that was happening in, in the early 2000s in, in Kenya. Started in Kenya and spread to other countries, but crazy move of God. And I remember the, being so frustrated because I'd come to churches and I'd be like, God can powerfully use your kids. Like, kids are not second-class citizens in, this, in the kingdom. Kids are not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. And I, I just began so, like, stirred up. And so many church leaders would be like, graham crackers? Felt bored? We're having the real church, so can somebody please keep the kids quiet so we can have the real church? And that was the mentality. I kept bumping into that. I was so frustrated. And I remember the Lord challenging me and saying, stop talking about it and just demonstrate it. And we literally spent the next decade doing that. I stopped telling, you know, I was doing a lot of itinerant stuff. We'd, I'd stop talking to these leaders about it, and I just would go back, and we would work with the kids, and, and all of a sudden, we'd cut the kids loose. And people would, I mean, literally be on their faces. I remember there was one, both here in the States and, and in Africa, there was this one event where, um, in this huge, this huge region in, in western Kenya, where all these bishops and pastors came together, and these kids, little kids, put on their own crusade. I'm talking, people were set free of demons. Hundreds and hundreds of people came to faith. Crazy things were happening. And on the floor, on their faces, were about 50 pastors weeping in repentance because they did not believe God could use their kids. And their kids brought massive, ended up bringing massive transformation to this city. Demonstrate it. Demonstration is a lot more powerful than our words. And I wonder if our churches would be more full in the West if we began to actually live and demonstrate what we believe versus just talking about it all the time. But the only way you can demonstrate is to be with him, is to be in the presence of love, it's to be in the presence of truth and be transformed by it. That's the only way we can do it. And Jesus radically demonstrates what's available to us. This is his culture. I think many times he's more interested Right, and what's actually happening inside of us, then if we can get all the questions right on the Sunday school test. He, he's, he's genuinely interested in, is transformation happening? Because the whole point of truth is to transform. Truth transforms. Truth sets us free. Truth changes us. I don't want to just talk about what faith can do. I want to demonstrate it. I don't want to just talk about who our God is. I want to demonstrate it. And I think the world is hungry to see it. Wouldn't you agree? People are hungry to see it. I'm hungry to experience it and see it myself. So, you know, truthful love is radically transformative. Jesus demonstrated it. Jesus was not afraid also to tell the truth. He wasn't afraid to tell the truth. You remember the moment where, where Jesus walks in and, or walks up and there's a whole scandal happening, and they're about to stone a woman who gets caught in, in adultery and this whole thing. I have so many questions about this story, but don't have time for that. He walks into the middle of this whole craziness, right? And he doesn't judge this woman. He intervenes in the situation. But also, Jesus isn't like, you've had a really hard life. I get it. He's fully compassionate towards this woman. Yet he also tells her, go and sin no more. Why? Why? Because he loved her enough to understand the only way she could really be free, she could walk away without being stoned and still be, still be trapped. Her only real freedom was going to be in the truth. Like, there's a better way. There's a better way. Walk in the better way. I've got real freedom for you, right? So he fully loves her, and he's fully present, but it's also a call higher. He was not afraid to tell the truth. Or you remember the rich young ruler? This is awkward awkward. He's a good guy. He's followed all the rules. He's done everything right. And he's like, Jesus, can I be in? And Jesus is like, sure, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and we're good. And he's like, what? You didn't ask that of anybody else. Dude, so unfair. And Jesus doesn't, you know, he doesn't, he's not like, have you noticed? Jesus is not out here making concessions for sensitive folks. <laughs> he's not. Does it mean, doesn't mean he's not deeply compassionate because we also see Jesus weeping with people. We see Jesus deeply compassionate, always present with people, but he doesn't shy away from the truth. He knew this was an idol in this man's heart, and for this man to really be free, he was going to have to deal with the idol. 
Does Jesus cater to his feelings when it says he's sorrow, sorrowful? This man was deeply sad. Is Jesus like, I'm sorry. No, just kidding. You know, like, he doesn't do that. We do that. Jesus, he doubles down. He turns around and he's like, it's harder for a rich man to get through the eye of a needle. Or a, a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. What? Dang, Jesus calm down. Like he is intense, but it's, he understands the power and the invitation that truth is. And he's not afraid to speak the truth. Truth takes priority, right? Over and over again. I mean, we even see where one of the lawyers complained that Jesus was insulting the Pharisees. Jesus turns to him and he's like, well, woe to you lawyers also. I mean, he's just like, okay, you know, like, There was too much at stake. He wanted freedom and healing and restoration for all of them. And anybody who thought that they were too good for the truth or that they had it together, he's like, oh, you got it together? Cool, let's have a chat. Woe to you. You know, like he's he's like, I got some truth for you too. You need an upgrade. You need an upgrade. You need an upgrade. You need an upgrade. You You all need an upgrade, right? You all need some freedom. Everybody, the imitation was for everybody. And Jesus constantly is, is speaking truth, yes, because he fully loved. He's not coming in swinging a bat at everybody. He's coming in fully loving, but not shying away from the truth. Do we shy from the truth in our relationships? I do, sometimes. We're also in a weird position where many times people like don't want to tell people the truth. And so they're like, you should just talk to the pastors. <laughs> so they've already been through 12 people who didn't tell them the truth. And then they come to us and we're like, we're going to tell you the truth. You need, you need some help. You need some freedom, right? Tough job, y'all. Tough job. Hona does it better than I do, as we all know his gifting. Um, <laughs> um, You know, Jesus says his mission was to bear witness to the truth. Sixty-six times in the New Testament, the gospel is identified as the truth. However uncomfortable the truth, you know, might make us or others feel, however offensive the truth might sound to unbelieving ears, however untimely the truth may, may be, Jesus always spoke the truth because he loved it. He understood its power. To change our lives. I want to be a truth teller. I want to love people enough that I'm willing to get uncomfortable. I'm, I want to be willing to have the hard conversations. And I want to demonstrate it first. I think a lot of what we're seeing in our culture is people don't want to have the hard conversations. You got weird during the pandemic. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Like, we just start doing all this. Slicing and dicing right? It's really unfortunate our kids are having such an awful time back there. (laughs) But this has become norm. Oh, you're a little funky? Cut you out. We don't have to talk. Oh, you know what? Whew, people vote different than me there. I don't need to go there anymore. Oh, staying friends with you means that we're going to have to have an honest conversation. No, thanks. And we're wondering why divorce rates are what they are and all the things. We have not been fighting for each other. And the only way that we can truly fight for each other, you guys, is this. We're going to have to learn to love each other enough to tell the truth. Last but not least, Jesus empowers us with his spirit of truth. Thank God for this. John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. This is comforting. The Holy Spirit, our helper, helps us, guides us, points us towards truthful love. The Holy Spirit helps us discern what's real and what's not. Thank God. You, I don't know how any of us can navigate this life, this day, this culture, this age, Los Angeles, 2022, fill in the blanks. How you can navigate anything without the Holy Spirit. Because it has become, 
that spirit of deception, it's become so intense, it's hard for good, sound people to even know what is right and what is wrong. It has become so wild. We need the Holy Spirit to tell you, take a left. Take a right. But I don't, doesn't just do it. Okay. Hush. <laughs> Speak. Whatever. Like, we need the Holy Spirit guiding us. You know, I think sometimes because we've been so, and I'm not trying to, you guys hear me in this, I'm not trying to bag on the West. I'm trying to help us become more powerful. I am the number one advocate for the church. I mean, obviously, I am a pastor. You all know this, against my will, right? <laughs> I, I believe in that. I believe in the local church. I believe passionately in, in what God is doing in his kingdom. I believe in this, and that's why I'm fighting for it. But I, I feel like, like so often, maybe in the West, we've been so comfortable that we haven't even needed the Holy Spirit. Because I have Google. And I can just call my whoever, guru, mentor, life coach, therapist, and get an answer. Why ask the Holy Spirit? Those aren't bad. But who are you going to first? Right? We... I don't need the Holy Spirit when I have good medicine. This is kind of a bit what, what we've become in the West, and I feel like God is awakening us to, you actually cannot survive without the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit actively working in your life every single day. And whatever dose of the Holy Spirit you got, you need more. Get yourself rebaptized, rebaptized in the Holy Spirit. You need more of the Holy Spirit in your life, right? We all need to be filled with him. We need to be filled with him with his power, with his truth, with his love, with his conviction, with his goodness. It's only through him and by him. We've been given the Holy Spirit. Shoot, you guys, Hona walked in <laughs> after I talked about him. <laughs> I didn't think he'd make it in time. Hi, babe. <laughs> um, that's hilarious. Um, my prayer for us is that we would be people who love the truth, who demonstrate the truth, who speak the truth, and who walk in the power of the spirit of the truth. Right? As we know, deception is only going to increase. But as followers of Jesus, it's time that we become fiercely awakened, transformed by, and empowered by truthful love. There is a desperate world that needs to experience truthful love. And so my prayer is that, that we would fall in love with the, with the truth. I don't know where you're at with your relationship with truth, but my prayer is that we would fall in love with the truth, whatever that looks like in your life. Download the Bible app. Download version. Get yourself in the Word. Start talk, reading the Bible to your kids. If you don't do that, talking about one verse a day with your kids, something. Get in the Word. Get Get the Bible on audio, and when you're in traffic and wanting to lose your mind, just listen to it. Get the word in you until you fall in love with it, right? Get it. Let the word just begin to come alive in you. Love the word. We need the truth. We need the truth in this time. And begin to pray. I don't know about you, but this season has challenged my love for humanity, we need to pray that God would grip our heart with his heart for people every day. Praying that prayer one time 10 years ago is not enough. We need to pray every day that God will break our heart for, for people, that we will love people like he loves and that we will see people like he sees them. It's in this place of truthful love that we're transformed and the world is transformed. So, we're going to do two things as we close. I want to pray for us. I want to pray that we would truly fall in love with truth. And that like Jesus, that we would make this our culture, being a people who are committed to truthful love. And then at the end, I'm going to also take a special moment as we're wrapping up AAPI Heritage Month. And I want to pray over our AAPI community. All right, so let's do this. Why don't you put your hand on your heart? 
Listen, you got anointing oil in your purse, you better bust it out, anoint yourself, whatever you got to do right now. <laughs> Jesus, we come before you. Jesus, the way that you love and demonstrate truth is so beautiful. God, we are recipients of your truthful love. It's your love for us, and it's, it's the way, God, that you have spoken truth to us that we ourselves have experienced freedom. God, I don't want to be 20% free. I want to be 100% free. God, I pray that your truthful love would come alive in me. Anywhere where there's been a separation between truth and love in my heart, God, I pray that you would marry those things back together. I pray, God, that the goal of my truth would always be love and the goal of love would always be truth, Lord, and that those things would be so united in me. God, I pray that we would be a people who love truth. Anywhere where there's trauma or fear around truth, God, I pray that you would break it off. Anywhere where we've been hurt by truth, by people trying to speak truth in a way that's not loving, I pray that you would heal. That we would not shy away. God, help us not to, to run from what is good and holy. Teach us, God, how to do it right. Teach us how to love wildly. Teach us how to be vessels of truth, so grounded in love. I pray that we would be transformed and that we would have the authority to help bring others into transformation. I pray, God, that we would truly be lovers of truth and that we would be known as a people who are so loving. I pray that when people meet us, that their testimony of us, their definition of us when we leave the room would be he or she is the most loving person I've ever met. And they spoke truth into my life that aligned, aligned me and shifted me. They showed me Jesus. They showed me there was another option. They showed me a powerful life. I want what they have. Lord, let that be the testimony of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take a moment and just pray and bless our Asian American Pacific Islander community. As we're wrapping up API Heritage Month, I actually want to just ask you to stand. If you are consider yourself a part of the API community, I want you to stand. I want to pray over you. I um this week as I was praying. And even just in this word, I felt like the Lord said to me that this is the season where we're actually going to see this thing I'm talking about, truthful love, that this is something that's so deeply written into the DNA of our AAPI community. And that our, th those of you guys here standing, I feel like there's a special anointing and gift for this season where you're going to lead and teach the body of Christ what it means to lead in truthful love. And I felt like the Lord said he's anointing voices to speak in this season, where the enemy has tried to silence, and the enemy has tried to get you to sit down, and the enemy has tried to, to, to disqualify. And I feel like the Lord, I just, the picture I had was like, I saw, mic, it's like spiritual microphones being handed to people in the AAPI community. And God was going to amplify voices because there's truth that needs to be heard. There's songs that need to be sung. There's books that need to be written. There's art pieces that need to be created. There's, there's things that you are carrying that are so vital in this season, so powerful, so carry the, the DNA of heaven. I see just God even releasing Preachers, and I see God releasing 
messages and I see God releasing just even like TED Talks. I just see there's a sound and a voice that's coming out of the AAPI community in this season that's unprecedented. And I want us to pray. I want us to pray over our brothers and sisters. Speak blessings. Stand with you. So if you're around somebody who's standing, will you just extend your hands to them? Jesus, we thank you for these legends in our community. We thank you, God, for how our brothers and sisters carry you so beautifully. We thank you for the unique calling. We thank you for how they model who you are to us. Jesus, we thank you that you have put a word in their mouth that is so needed in this hour. Whether that's released through art or film or blogging or conversations or preaching or whatever it looks like, I thank you, God, that you have been developing and, and preparing them for this moment. And Father, we stand as a community with our brothers and sisters. And even as this month, Lord, we just, we're celebrating heritage, but we're also just been um, just resourcing and, and advocating just even against the AAPI hate that's been happening in our world. And God, we speak your covering. We speak your protection. We speak your blessings over them and their families in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, that there is so much purpose and destiny. We thank you that you have sent them to this community. We recognize the call of God. We recognize the, the leadership that they bring. We thank you, God, and we ask that you would elevate them in this season. God, we ask that you would have your way in them, that they would feel more empowered, more seen, and more heard than ever before. Jane, Jane, um, I felt, as we were praying, I just feel like the Lord is saying, this is your season to run. This is your season to run, and you've been running. But everything, where every place where the enemy has tried to silence you, it's ending. Your voice is so needed. It's so needed. And it's been so refined in his presence, and you have stewarded it so beautifully, and it has not been in vain. Father, we release everything that you have for our sister right now. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for the fire in her bones to preach the gospel. I thank you, Jesus, for the passion in her heart to serve you. God, I thank you that you are going before her right now and opening the right doors that you are aligning and opening doors. We bless it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.